It's like, oh, my favorite gag in First Blood is a log with spikes on it, but we're in a VFW, so I have a beer keg with spikes on it. Um, so just kind of even that, but a lot, I would say 50% of it was actually in the script. And then also, it's just like, what are the coolest things we can do if you're in a bar? How could you fucking kill people with all the shit that's in a bar, organically and realistically? I mean, just stupid shit that we're having fun coming up with on set, you know, this fucking blast. In Dora's, Dora's weapon, God, that sword. That was like deer it's antlers. It's mache sword. It's a, whatever. <laughs> that was fucking awesome. Yeah, that, that was, was really just cool. Sometimes if I turned around too quickly, I would hit myself in the face with it. And that was really fun. Um, but yeah, the machete was like honestly like my favorite part about. Well, that and my jacket. But other than that, the machete was pretty sick. It was really fun to work with. If you see this young lady in the hallway, just ask us this question. Avoid her. <laughs> One female who asks the question asks about the weapons. Avoid this lady. <laughs> I would recommend possibly having a drink during the movie, some whiskey, a beer, uh, lube you up a little bit. Um, the movie's pretty short, it's like 92 minutes. It stars Stephen Lang, William Sadler, Martin Cove, and Fred the Hammer fucking Williamson, who will be here for a Q&A after. Um, make sure you keep your phones away because the director is in the audience and if I see one fucking phone, <laughs> I'm gonna stick the hammer on you. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, there's no trailers because this is on 35 millimeter. Um, and we'll be up here in 92 minutes. So enjoy. Is this on? Oh, it's so on. Hi, everyone. And that's why the guys are here, not watching at home, right? 
There's also a fun fact about you have a, a connection with this arc light, don't you? I worked at ArcLight a long time ago. I used to come here and read movies and make sure none of you assholes had their phones out, which technically no one here did. I thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, so, and I said to B, who's my um, illustrious camera assistant and long time co producer, uh, we worked at ArcLight together and I was like, I know that I've made it when I open a movie at ArcLight. And now that I've opened a movie here, I certainly do not feel like I've made it. <laughs> Fred, we have to start with you. Thank you for being here, by the way, and joining us tonight. So it is my total pleasure to be here, uh, to watch this grandeur film uh, directed by this person over here. Um, I've been a lot of movies with big time directors like uh, Ronald Altman, uh, Enzo Castellari, Jack Cohen. I mean, I, I never met director who had holes in the knees of his pants. <laughs> I'm making low budget movies. I'm not going to talk to you. I hope for sure that this movie is a huge success to help him buy some pants. <laughs> if not, I will personally take up a contribution to help him out. And the hair. I, I won't even talk about that. <laughs> When I first met him, they said, this is the director. And you need a camera on my face at that moment when he said that, this is the director. I said, wow, what kind of movie is this going to be? Tennis <laughs> shoes, made in 1955. <laughs> the black high top tennis shoes, made in 1955. He wears them. I don't know if he has them on now. Oh, he's got a low top. Oh, it went low. He went cool. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it was most definitely a pleasure working on this film. We had a great time. I didn't get to kill enough people as I wanted to. <laughs> he let me kill, I think, three or four, man. But that's not what I do. My minimum is five. <laughs> the man gave me three people to beat up and kill. But I, I thank him for that. And uh, hope we can do another one. Because as you know, in this movie, I didn't die. And I never died. Yeah. Fred, you do have, you famously have three rules. Would you share what those rules are? And also tell us, how did, uh, Joe, how did you get Fred to, to make this? How did you deal with those rules? But first, Fred, the rules. Well, certainly, you know, being, being the, 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 the macho guy that I am, which I, you know, it's personal, I can't help that. <laughs> and my contract, one. You can't kill me in a movie. Two, I had to win all my fights in a movie. And three, I get the girl at the end of the movie if I want her. <laughs> my count, you're over three. No, no, no. The third one is you're out. The first two are not. We don't talk about those. They're, they, they don't change. The third one, I will relinquish because I know they don't want me to have the girl anyway. Because usually it's a bond. So. You know, I have to provide my own girls for that purpose. But in the movie, I know that they're not going to give me that, so I really understand. So I read this movie. I read. I talked to the, the director. I talked to my agent, and my first question I, I asked, "Do I die in the movie?" And he said, "Yes." And I said, "I'm not doing the movie. Forget it. It's not about the money. I don't care how much money you offer me. I'm not dying." He said, "Well, read the script." So I read the script. So I came up with this compromise that do I die? Or do I die? <laughs> when I say, who the fuck said I was dead? Am I dead? Do I fall off the chair? Do I slump over like I'm dead? No, it's your choice to assume whether I die or whether I did die. So they agreed to that. Henceforth and Madworth, we made the movie together. <laughs> <laughs> different movies and different ways to die in this movie. What do you guys think? No. No? Oh, that's pretty clear now. Well, it's because later on we discuss a sequel, maybe. <laughs> he says, you're not going to die in the movie, okay? <laughs> so, Joe had it in mind all the time. <laughs> yeah, we can make a sequel. I'm pretty sure. Okay, I want to go 
let's actually jump to Antifar and hello, Steve. Hi. How are you? I, okay. But I want to hear about what everybody's idea of what this movie was going to be based on talking to Joe. And Sierra, I, I randomly one day walked into a coffee shop and these two were sitting having, I think, their first meeting about oh, this God, movie. You're so right. I forgot about that completely. What were your first impressions of this and why did you want to play Lizard? Well, I think Joe looks like the movies that he makes. So as soon as I met him, I was very excited. For some reason, his appearance is just reassuring when he's directing your horror movie. So I was like, okay, this guy, this guy knows something. And then uh, when we had that meeting, actually, we hardly talked about like the script itself. We really didn't. We just talk about uh, Driller Killer and like Danzig going on tour. We just like talked. About, we just like shot the shit. But um, yeah, we had a conversation. I was like, wait, I still don't know if I want to do the movie because we talked about other shit. <laughs> Yeah, eventually, obviously, he made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> and it, what attracted me to Lizard in the first place was just the uh, the movie has so much machismo, you know, the cast is stacked with all these legendary male actors, and, you know, there, it's, it's very bare knuckles, like, brawly kind of movie, very, you know, action-packed and such. And so I wanted to really experiment with kind of immersing myself into that environment, that real like boys club, like masculine environment. And I think I did all right. You held your own. Yes, you did. Did you, did you get the stab in that today? I did. That was, that was pretty fun, but it was mostly because I just really enjoy stabbing Josh specifically. <laughs> it's like, it's quite an achievement, you know, because obviously in real life that would absolutely never happen. Sierra, so. calm down, it's just a rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> and Travis, Graham, Dora, and Josh, you guys really truly helped put the riotous scuzz in VFW. And uh, it just looks like you guys are having so much fun. You filmed this in Dallas in this incredible location. Um, which is, I believe, a found VFW right across the, the street from like a movie theater. Um, but what was it like to be on set? This this movie was filmed, I think, in only a few weeks. If you, you can call it like a fortnight and, and a half or something, you know? Really, really fast. But tell me, all of you guys, what was it like to be on set and, and how were you, like, how did you dive in to both their characters the vibe of this post-apocalyptic scuzzy world? Um, I guess I mean, for to the question of being on set, the, like the, the art direction and the locations were truly fabulous. That, that penthouse above that abandoned movie theater was just, uh, you know, like the spray paint. It was something we didn't really get to see too much, but you know, it was like stacks of like crazy TVs and stereo equipment and just, it was, um, it was fucking great. You know, that's all. And like, you know, that abandoned movie theater with these little burn barrels going on, like this empty stage, like, you know, horrible. It's just like, everything was so evocative of, you know, the style and tone of what they were trying to go for. And, you know, obviously the inside of the BFW just looked fucking great. It was just all, like, really on point for, yeah, the style and tone in that world, that sort of that world of darkness they were trying to bring out. This is probably the most crappy shitty movie I ever made. <laughs> really? I'm done yet. Having that blood, all that shit on me all day. Go home, wash it off. Takes two hours to hang in the tub, soak all that stuff off. Then you go back in the morning, eight o'clock, and have somebody stand there and spray the shit all over you again. I mean, dude, that ain't fun. Let me tell you. Maybe the movie was fun, but having to match what you look like the day you shot is a bitch. And you're supposed to stand there and smile. Oh yeah, give me some more blood over here and pour some on your face. That's crappy and shitty, man. Joe's pitch to me actually was, you get to keep your clothes on this time. You won't be covered head to toe in blood like you were last time. And you also don't have to drink gallons of it. 
oh, this is just a shitty carpenter fucking riff. You know what? Oh, when carpenters were releasing movies, I don't remember people saying this is a shitty Howard Hughes riff. So Howard Hawks riff, sorry, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, you know, I feel like I'm drawing, obviously, Carpenter a little bit, but I feel like I'm drawing on a lot of influences, a lot of stuff in this did. I'm also trying to put my spin on it. I mean, I'm trying to do my own thing, and, um, you know, Carpenter and Walter Hill are probably one of my two biggest genre non horror straightforward influences. Carpenter's a horror guy, but I mean, straightforward, he's more of a Western action guy. Um, so, for something like this, I feel like that's what I was drawing from. Fred, what did, what did uh, this experience with making VFW remind you of in terms of the movies that you had made in the past? Like, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess my question is, were there scrappy, independent filmmakers, you know, innovating on low budgets, being creative? Well, those are the best people that make the best kind of movies anyway. The less money you have, the more creative you're forced to, forced to become. And you have a lot of money, you do a lot of things that people sit and watch and keep waiting for something to happen, but they have all this money and they want to make a film look big and make a film look gigantic. But if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of time, you get right to the point. You have good people around you, you don't have to be the direct, you let them do their thing. All you have to do is point them in the right direction and then give them the performance that you expect. Low budget movies are more entertaining than these 92 million, 200 million dollar films. They get boring after a while. The most exciting part of a, one of these big budget films is what you see on television, the, the commercial. The commercial is the heart of the film after that. The rest of the film is a piece, a piece of nothing. Our films can't do that. We can't bore our audience. You have to keep them excited, keep them interested all the time. Otherwise, they'll never come see your movies again. As they said, the guy makes cheap movies, they're boring. They'll never say that about his movie, and they'll never say that about my movies. By the way, we will go to a couple questions if you have some, just get them ready. Um, I want to ask kind of all of you because you're all on set in this in this film so much, but especially the the scenes of our heroes together in the bar, especially early on before the shit hits the fan. You guys, Fred, you and, and your co-stars are riffing and there's such good crackling instant chemistry, you feel the history between all these characters. And that can't have been easy, but how do you describe how you guys all found that together? Well, it was good writing, first of all, and then it was our interpretation of what was written. And that's really what made it work. You have guys who are professional, we know the characters, we know how we want to portray them, and then the words fit our mouth, we say the words. If the words don't fit, we have to add this and watch the girl's face. And if you smile, it's good. And if he doesn't smile, it's not good. <laughs> you know? So we don't, we don't take control of the movie. We just do what we're told and add our little flair and add our personality to the character and try to please the director. That's what really makes it work. Does anyone have a favorite ad or what I call like happy accidents? There's a scene, by the way, like in the bathroom when the photo falls. That was not planned, right? It was very planned to the point where we did that fucking shot more times than any other guy did. Okay, fine. I thought it was action. My favorite bathroom is when he's like, where was your pussy here? Where did it go? That's my personal favorite. I never really asked you me. I'm asking all of you. Sierra? Mm, I mean, I had the best spit. Yeah, you did. <laughs> That's the greatest spit captured. It really ties your character up with a nice little Thank you. All that was running through my head exactly when I did it. Yeah, because it's going to be a cute little button. <laughs> <laughs> what was the hardest kill to, uh, to nail? Well, theoretically, it should have been the flagpole going through Dora's head, but. Um, she held this yoga pose with this little contraption uh, attached to the side of her head for a solid three or four minutes. So. Who would have really thought fun. that my yoga training would come into play to like be a fucking demon banshee from hell in all of your scary ass movies? They wear sunglasses right now looking at me. Yeah, they fell off my shirt, so I didn't want to step on them because they're all alone. Alone? Uh, <laughs> um, yes, but her kill where she got attacked by the flag. 
Paul was, uh, should have been the hardest, um, came out the best, it looks fucking awesome. Um, a lot of the effects in this movie, we actually did uh, what we call second unit, even though I directed them. What we did is we had five day weeks, and then on Saturday, me, Josh Russell, Sierra Russell, our makeup effects crew, Mike Tess, and my DP, and uh, B, all the people in the audience. So give them a fucking round of applause. They came in on Saturday, uh, no extra pay, and we did a skeleton crew where we just shot explosions, we shot flagpoles going through heads, and we shot all those little inserts that really tie all the effects things together. And if um, these guys didn't follow me and do this shit on a Saturday on the day off, and we weren't able to make this happen, it would have looked as good as it was. So that's how that last stuff came together. So thank you guys. Do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, we have one right up there, please. Go for it. Come say it loud, please. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, do you think that there is an alternate ending somewhere where the whole thing is actually a themed birthday party? <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought about it. But... <laughs> it's like April Fool's Day. <laughs> that was the best question I've ever heard. <laughs> April Fool's Day. Did you watch this movie yet? <laughs> I think he was asleep on this movie. Yeah. <laughs> also, I want to point out that I've done a dozen, a dozen, a dozen of these Q&As, and the retention of audience is the best I've ever seen. You guys have no questions. So. Uh, so you, guys, you guys got the hammer up there. Oh, we got questions. I can right there. Oh, um, I thought the score was really sick. So I was going to ask if there were any specific inspirations for that. For um, the composer I've worked with, this is the third time I've worked with them, and uh, I think we just have a very similar aesthetic and kind of place where we're coming from, and it's gotten to the point now where we've done three movies together, so he's able to riff, he knows what I want to riff off that, and we're going to go back and forth. So I feel like we make each other do better work in that regard, and that it's just, it's a complete, um, it's a complete understanding of, you know, working together and like having that collaboration. I think that's why it's important to always work with the same people, because build off each other, keep doing better work, um, and everything goes to the whole, you know, that's why people who are like, oh, I love what you do, you will to switch out your crew. I'm like, no, I feel like what I do, I'm going to switch out my crew, you know. The composer brings just as much to the table as an editor, as a producer, as a DP, like, so I feel like that's all, that's all part of the package, you know. Well, and your close collaborators are all, like, a lot of them are doing double or triple duty. Josh, um, Brian Dutton, who, what are his credits, like, Associate producer. Uh, associate producer, focus puller, film loader, and blunt roller. <laughs> and, and best hug giver. <laughs> and he's like a corpse stand-in in one of the... Oh, he's George Weiss couple. He's over there. He's over there. Uh, we have a question right up front. I have a question. Uh, this is actually for the hammer. Um, when you made the transition from football to acting, what tools did you learn playing professional sports did you bring the acting and how, how they helped you out? You were asking how pro football and, and acting correlate. Uh, sometimes when you play, it's bullshit. Sometimes when you play, you don't have to fake it. Acting is all bullshit. <laughs> Just like that. I'm pretending to be somebody that I'm not. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I feel it, man. That gets to your ass. I'm the hammer. I portray the hammer. I know what I represent. I know that what I represent is real. Uh, in my hometown, I was a thug. I'm a, I'm a reformed thug with a charm and a finesse now <laughs> that I learned over the years. And I try to bring that to the screen. I don't play a tough guy. I play the guy that's tough. That's a big difference. So, uh, yeah, whatever you said is true. It all correlates. It's all bullshit. <laughs> Fred, um, I, I wanted to ask, because in, over your, the course of your career, both in front of and behind the camera, you've been involved in telling various veteran stories. I know veteran causes in real life are important. Fred, the real Fred, um, such as your work with the Wounded Warrior Project. Yes. And um, because I'm a former Marine, so I work closely with the service. So I have a problem with the And in Palm Springs at Fantasy 
reference to the one in last year. This year was in the towel. So that's, uh, makes me feel good. And my grandson, even the sign came to the golf tournament. So I'm sure. So we had a good time. And it's a good feeling. You go away with a good feeling that you did something good. And that's why I have it. Well, when you made your own directorial debut, a movie called Mean Johnny Barrows. I made, I, I directed about 35, 37 films. Only because everybody wants to kill me in a movie. I'm going to kill the black guy. I'm going to kill me in the first five minutes and then have Schwarzenegger against my death. Kill Schwarzenegger, then he avenge his death. Great idea. I love that. So I <laughs> the only way I could do the things that I wanted to do and portray the character that I had started making my own. I started knocking on doors and, and, and raising money, but I was very smart than most people are. They come into this business. I understood that I had a market, a market in the foreign market. So my first monies that I raised came from France and came from Germany. It was sweet because I went to Cannes and sit on the terrace at the Cannes Film Festival and had nothing but posters and very good looking girls with tight t-shirts on with the name of my movie on it. And that's how I sold the movie. They gave me the contracts for the movie and I brought the contracts back to the bank. First of all, sent to this bank, loaned me money against the contracts, and that's how I made my first movie. That's a smart thing. That's a very intelligent guy doing stuff like that. It was, it, was, it was new to me that I could go do this and not knowing what I was doing. And after that, it was easy because the film made money. And every it's going to make money because if you keep it budget reasonable, you always got to make money. We don't need to make 50 million to be happy. He'll, he'll be happy with 25 million. <laughs> yeah, but 2.5 million. <laughs> we don't need 50 million. We work because we enjoy it. We'll, we work because we're having fun. And if you keep your budget at a reasonable budget, you're always going to make money. If you make a good film, you're going to make money. It's hard to lose some money in a film under a million dollars. It's very hard to do that. Unless it's really a piece of shit. But by, the time, <laughs> by the time they learn that it's a piece of shit, they've already spent the money on this. <laughs> it's the second one you won't make any money on. The first one is a piece of shit, so you won't get any money on the second one. But the first one is good, and the next money, you can continue to do that. So I've made about 75, 77 movies doing things like that. Just understanding who you're making the movie for, understanding your public, putting the right cast together, and just having fun. Not having fun, it ain't worth making. Well, uh, yes, I I wanted to bring up also something that maybe a lot of people don't realize is that the, there's a dedication at the end of your film, Me and Johnny Barrows, dedicating it to the veteran who traded his place on the front line for a place on the unemployment line. Peace is hell. Well, that came about when the way that America treated the soldiers when they came home from Vietnam. It was embarrassing and ridiculous the way that they treated them. They treated them like they were the enemy, like they had done something wrong, they were fighting for no cause. And I, I thought that was very disrespectful because you bring all these young guys over there and teach them to kill. And then when they come home, there's no job because they're not respected for being in a war. So I made it for that purpose. Uh, the Korean veterans were not treated correctly. And how much? Do you think that VFW to you is for the aims of the world? VFW is very important. As he tried to do in the film, we, we, we made some comments, some some comments throughout the film talking about the purpose of the VFW, guys come home, have a home, being around guys who feel the same way that they do, and they have a home, they don't have to explain it to anybody, just show up, and everybody has a good time. It's, it's, you get it off out of your system, you forget about the ugly things that you've seen in the war. That's what the VFW lives does for most of us guys. It was, it was kind of touched on in the movie a little bit. Joe touched on it a little bit. So I appreciate it a lot. It was really respectful for him to do that. Thank you. Um, question away. Thank you for your answer. Uh, question away up top. Yes. What's next for Joe? What's next for Joe? What's next for everybody, let's say? Uh, I don't know. I'm writing stuff, whatever somebody wants to finance, hopefully a time travel movie or a werewolf movie. Uh, <laughs> you know that, it's not smart. 
I'm ready right now. I've never seen Good Boss of Finance. Um, I really love Good World. We also did a time travel movie. Um, both NC-17 and Shadow 16 over here. My next movie is in Spain. I'm going to Spain uh, a couple of months to do a western with uh, my director, Enzo Castellari, who directed me in uh, Inglourious Passes. So we're going to do a western in Spain. Hopefully, in the near future, me and this guy will be doing something together. So. I'm going to write a role for Fred Williams and every fucking script that I write in all I have a name of the Josh? Uh, I have a name of I'm cheerfully unemployed. Um, <laughs> excuse you, tell us about what you recently had in theaters, things that you worked on. So uh, after I did uh, Bliss while we were still finishing that, I got um, Red Island Hustle for MGM Orion. And then the exact day. Is Rattle Hustle playing here right now? I don't know. If it is, that means this dude has edited two movies playing at the Arclight right now, which is a pretty big fucking deal. Uh, and then as soon as, uh, like, the day that my contract was up with them, I left a really nice, cushy corner office in Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, Matt Mercer up there, and I drove to Dallas, Texas to start shooting the FW with these guys. In the so lap of luxury, right? Yeah, so, so that's why I'm cheerfully employed. <laughs> um, I have a film premiering at South by Southwest called Lapsus, which is cool. Um, I wrote a pilot that I'm trying to get made, but other than that, I'm just like making a tiny human. So I'm just going to do a lot of cables between now and September, and that's all that's on my list. Congrats, Dora. Um, I'm in a, a film in the summer called Mystery Spot. That is going to be uh, coming out soon this year. Um, that's in Mystery Spot? Huh? No. <laughs> um, and yeah, just trying to get another, uh, get another movie made. See you Um, I have a, I have a puzzle on my coffee table that's just keeping <laughs> my ass. It's just all red curtains and I just, it's, it's slow and steady wins the race, but it's it's the foreseeable future. Travis, by the way, what was it like meeting the hammer when your actual name is Hammer? I don't think that's a conversation you really bring up. I think I remember I was like in a wardrobe fitting and there was a pair of just jeans hanging up and in Sharpie written on the inside, just hammer. I'm like, all right, well, he's claimed it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a double whammy for me because his name was Hammer, and he hired a guy named Waves, and I didn't know who he was and never met him. But people ask him, what time is that my son? I said, no, I ask me that all the time, too. Is that my yeah. son? Yeah, well, I got a son standing right there. Big, 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 big. Oh! Turn oh. him Yeah, we saw the original. 
the first time it's all going very fast, and you see it the second time, you get to pick out special things that, that you'd like to do. Mm -hmm. That's, That's a good point. That's a good point. You have to see this movie more than once to really see everything that's going on. Okay, a few final questions. Oh, yes, uh, back there. Two-part question for Joe. Uh, first part, you had Fred the Hammer and Martin Covenness in a bar. I was there not a bottle of King Cobra in there somewhere? Ah. Ah. I'm, the, I'm the first one to admit that I did not know about that until we were on set. And actually, Jen texted me, and she's like, did you know Martin Cove and Fred Lewis did King Cobra commercials? And I was like, I had no fucking clue. Yeah, I hired him. I brought him in. You missed money too, because King, you could have had was Anna Isaac Bush. You probably could have got some money. But uh, well, they sponsored us, thankfully. Well, that's why the only neon scenes are fucking Budweiser. Yeah, we should, did you tell them that uh, we were? No, we didn't. Obviously, we were in the movie together. You would have got another check. <laughs> you would have got one more check. You told them we were together. What was that reunion like, by the way, for you, Fred? It was great. I mean, he's a good guy. He's a, he's a, he's, he's a nice person, and, and he speaks well of me. And, uh, <laughs> he's a good guy. He, he really good. He brought his son to the set. His son was, was an obnoxious guy, but... Uh, <laughs> Marty was a good guy. How would you guys all bond, anyway? Because you haven't met everybody, right? Me? Yeah, but I know that you bring cigars everywhere you go. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, you know, I, I don't share them, but I, I bring them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we get along because they don't really know how a good guy or a bad guy will kick their ass on. I mean, you know, that's the power of being the hammer. <laughs> People don't know which hammer is going to confront them when they say hello. Either you bothering me, or it's nice to meet you. And that comes across very clear. Oh yeah, when we were getting ready for our fight scene that day, I was in Dora. I was this bitch for eight hours, and then the next day I was Dora again. But that was like the fun part. I was like, yeah, I'm getting fast by the <laughs> I'm sorry, up there you had a two-part question. Was the second question good? First one was good, I'm just saying. Well, it was for me, so I want to hear it. Oh, fine. The, the second part is for Joe as well. <laughs> What advice would you have for somebody in 2020 um, that's looking to get an independent movie made? All right, I don't want to get that one. All right, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, literally, dude, the only thing I would say is that you have the ability to shoot stuff on 4K now. You have the ability to edit nonlinear, like shit that wasn't available three years ago. Uh, we, when we made Almost Human, I was like, what's the most that we can put together? What's the absolute top quality project to put together? And me and Josh, you know, apply for credit cards and we figure out what the amount that we can make is. And it's like, this is the amount that we have. Let's figure out a movie for that amount. And um, for me, having a feature film is so much better as a calling card than having a short, having a fucking film school degree, having anything. Because if you have a finished feature, then it's, you're ahead of 99.9% of people in this town. Whether it's, I, the reason I made a feature for as little as I did is because I looked around and people were making absolute pieces of shit garbage. Absolute garbage and getting careers off this. So I said to Josh, like, dude, look, you know for a fact just as much as I do, we can make something that's at least as competent as this garbage. Um, so let's go do it. And we made a movie, and I mean, the movie was fine, it was competent. Like, I look back now and it's like, oh, I'm gonna make that competent movie, but because we made that extremely competent movie that wasn't really that great, we were able to, like, continue to be a movie. So, I mean, the thing is, you just gotta go out there and fucking make movies and, like, learn from mistakes because if you're not directing, you're not gonna learn anything. And if you're not learning anything, you're not gonna move forward. So, you just gotta make shit. And um, everybody else is making shit, so you gotta get out of the pack and just fucking do it, man. Just fucking do it, man. <laughs> do it. Yes, question right there. Yeah, um, this is for Fred, um, or the hammer, but whatever you like to call it. Uh, <laughs> is that how, how you say it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you've got to ask the question. Um, so, um, my dad was in Korea. He's 91. Um, I don't know when, you know, the ferryman's going to come for him, but... I would, I've always asked him, like, I'd love to hear, he'll never talk about it, and I'd love to hear about it before that time comes. Uh, from experience, is that 
really ever going to happen, or is it something you guys keep yourself? Um, no, I don't think it's ever going to happen. You want to explain? We have to explain to you how he survived and how he sustained his own sanity coming from all this death and possible death of his own. To explain that to you is going to be impossible. I don't think he's going to ever be able to clearly explain that to you. Um, I'm even having trouble right now. So, no. You know here. Do we have any other questions over here? Yes? I have a question for Joe. Um, how long was your prep time? Um, and uh, also, how many shooting days? Like um, a lot of work. Yeah, the prep time um, like was on and off. I was rewriting the script for a few months, but I was also making my other movie bliss like, in the meantime. So I was kind of going back from the script, but I would say a part of development time where it was like, we're going to start shooting this movie on April 8th, and it's currently the middle of February. We probably had six or seven weeks of like hard, hard prep time where I actually visited Dallas, location scouted, started hiring people, like figuring out stuff like that. So. Um, but the fact of the matter is, we shot this movie in April last year, premiered in September, and now it's early so in February, so like, the entire thing's been a fucking whirlwind. Um, we certainly shouldn't have had as little prep as we did, but I feel like for the style of like controlled chaos, this movie is almost worked in its favor, um, because we just kind of have to get out there and fucking... It's almost like you're thrown into a situation, just like these bed stars, where like you got to react. Your, your, the entire movie's reactionary to what's going on, because it's like we're thrown into a situation. Also, dealing with eight fucking legends and I have all kinds of effects going around me, you know, I didn't even have time to prep it, so it's like, uh, it's very controlled chaos, I think, lets us on this type of movie, um, but it was very, very, very fucking fast, and I would not recommend that, unless uh, you had no choice, like I did. Any, any women out there uh, got a question? <laughs> that is, that is one, one woman, one young female, or old female, or medium age female, one question. We have any? Come on, ladies. Yes. Um, yeah. I just had a question on the weapons that people made. I thought it was really interesting how they were they came about. Did you like study this somewhere, or like, where did you come about these all these ideas? Uh, well, some of them were in the script, um, but some of them we weren't able to execute just based on location or time or anything like that, so um, I really have, <laughs> I have no uh, actual knowledge of like Vietnam stuff beyond what I saw in movies, so I got this great. I tried as much as I could to get into that shit, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of the stuff is like from other movies, like not other movies, but just what I've fucking seen in Vietnam stuff like transformed, it's like, oh, my favorite gag in First Blood is a lot with spikes on it, but we're in a VFW style of beer keg with spikes on it. Um, so it's kind of even that, but I would say 50% of it was actually in the script. And then also it's just like, what are the coolest things we can do if you're in a bar? How could you fucking kill people with all the shit that's in a bar? Organically and realistically. I mean, just stupid shit that we're having fun coming up with on set, you know, this is fucking blast. And Dora's, Dora's weapon, that, that sword. That was like deer it's antlers. It's mache, sure. It's a, whatever. That was fucking awesome. Yeah, that, that was, was really just cool. Sometimes if I turned around too quickly, I would hit myself in the face with it. That was really fun. Um, but yeah, the machete was like honestly like my favorite part about. Well, that and my jacket. But other than that, the machete was pretty sick. It was really fun to work with. If you see this young lady in the hallway, just ask us this question. Avoid her. <laughs> One female who asks the question asks about the weapons. Avoid this lady. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. That's a great You've done so many genre movies that involve crazy weapons and crazy action. Like, what was there? Was there stuff that you invented on set yourself for your character? A lot of stuff is invented. I mean, it all depends on whether or not you like the guy that you're fighting or don't like the guy that you're fighting. You know, uh, you find 
inventive ways to kill him if you don't really like him. You <laughs> poke his eyes out and pull his nose off his face, and then you let the special effects people work that out. So, yeah, that depends on how I feel about the guy that I'm fighting. Will I make a really nice, manly, macho fight? Or I do something particularly nasty and dirty, like stick my finger in his eye and, and rip his ears off his head and let the special effect guys work that out. One of my favorite moments from the movie is we shot all the stuff in the DFW in sequence. So when it got to the point where we're doing the montage, Fred, um, his character was basically just somebody who was being the shit out of people, and because his, our, his character was a free of work, that he didn't have as much action in the original script, I just wanted to bring Fred into the forefront, bring that stuff in. So we're doing the first montage where Slang dumps over the toolbox, and you know, Walter, he grabs his weapon, and Slang grabs his weapon, and Sierra grabs her weapon, and they grab the matchsticks, and all this. And Fred, in the script, didn't actually have a weapon. So we've got 15 minutes to shoot this scene, and I'm on camera, and I'm like, all right, Slang, dump this over, you do this, you do this, you do this, and Fred's like, what am I doing? Like, fucking improv to think about. So I'm like sitting there with the camera, and I'm like going down, going down, and I land on Fred at the end, and as I land on him, he has a fistful of nails sticking out of his hand. I literally, like, it was so hard not to laugh in excitement as I was operating the camera to see him holding this fist up. And I'm like, dude, I literally would never have to call something that fucking cool. And then, like, I hand the camera up, and he's just got this smile with this rim light on, and I'm like, but all right, well, this is filmmaking. <laughs> I was in character. That's what I wanted to do when those guys came through the door and ripped the show. And there was nothing down. All the weapons were going to take it, but all the other guys, the only thing left was some nails, so. If I hit a guy with eight nails in my hand, I'm going to really be a happy guy. <laughs> and I said to the prop guy, I'm like, hey, so we got the scene in two hours and Fred has to punch this guy with nails in his hand. We don't have any fake nails. Can you figure something out? All right, I'm going over here. And the prop guy's just like, what the fuck? So um, it ended up working out really well. But uh, yeah, it's very cool. That's where it makes the movie making fun, guys. Inventing things that work and if they don't work, you know, cut them out. But don't be afraid to do something different or to try it because it may turn out to be something brilliant. You never know. My favorite thing is that every single day I come to set and Fred will be like, how many other fucks am I going to kill today? <laughs> Zero on the schedule, Fred. I kept waiting. <laughs> and 20 pages of dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> you made me wait until the last day to just kill three people. Yeah, come on. Five is my limit. Don't forget that. Josh, how did you get cast as a character named Tank? Uh, George just said you were going to play Tank. <laughs> I mean, he's, so the only, so an almost human, I get, uh, just about the shit kicked out of me. And you movie. have a nude scene in Almost yeah. Human. And then, uh, in, in Joe's second movie, it was just, it was just one cameo. You have a nude scene, dude? Yeah. Ooh. Freezing cold mess. Really? Wow. Sending DVDs. You're right. saying, dude, you're going to be excited, will you? <laughs> but then, uh, in the second movie, we the same, same man, because we're Paul Springs. In the second movie, I basically just, uh, I had like the, the one day of being killed, but then he, uh, it was so fucking cold, the blood wouldn't actually bump, so I had to shoot that three times. And then, um. With no clothes on? No, 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 that was like, I just took a fucking hat. I was like, okay. okay. Um, and then I didn't actually get to die in Bliss when I was supposed to because we had we had to spend so much time uh, getting like George and, and uh, George Mike was also the FW and our other friend Abe Ben Ruby. Uh, so this one was nice because everybody has to fight me. Um, and then Fred actually he actually took that chair hit and and, so, and he told Joe he said no no I don't need a bat I don't need a stunt person just get it right the first time and then proceeded to shoot it three times. So he actually took that hit with no pad fell to the ground. Like three times was absolutely ridiculous. I was terrified, and I was—I didn't even have to throw it in there. I was throwing it like one of the grips. I'm the hammer, brother. <laughs> I've been hit hard many times in my life. Ten years of football, yeah, I've been hit pretty hard, man. With a chair. Worse. Football is a lot different. Right? Somebody smaller than this. To my little bit bigger than this guy, full speed into my chest. I didn't remember it, but they told me. It was <laughs> uh, we'll take one more question from the audience. Um, I would say make it good, but now we're just desperate for any question. Oh. Oh well. Wait. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll do. 
it. I'll, I'll, I'll make that sacrifice. Uh, first <laughs> off, thank you guys for allowing veterans in for free to the movie. That was really cool. That wasn't here. That was in the house. Oh. Well, it said it on the ticket, but. Um. Yeah. Uh, but also, what was everyone's favorite, like, fuck yeah moment of the movie? Finishing it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when, he, when he told me I could beat up somebody, because I kept waiting and waiting and waiting, I kept messaging, am I going to fight somebody today? Go, we're we'll working on it. <laughs> so finally he said, okay, when somebody runs, two people are going to run through the door, you take out the first one, throw the other one, bang, bang some piece of water, yeah, all right, man. So that was, that was, that was my let's do it moment. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with Joe, just mentioning the uh, just unbelievable lot of work. And also halfway through shooting, we also had to fly to New York to, uh, uh, yeah. we had the, the premiere of uh, Bliss. And Fred actually gave us a couple of scars. I know he didn't give them out, but he gave us a couple. What? Um, well, you know, they were for gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> it was a special for us too, they had the hammer label, right? Okay, yeah, you take the label off, got the label? No. Oh, was it hammer? Got me another one. Hammer's got his own cigars? Oh, well. well. What would you expect from <laughs> Dora. Uh, I think my fuck yeah moment was I really, I actually really liked my death scene. I thought it was pretty sick. I mean, I know that Joe only asked me to do this movie because he already had a cast in my head. And he didn't have time to make another one for any other bitch. But I really liked my death scene. Like, that was really gnarly and it ended up like looking cool. And I love like the like, <laughs> I've been practicing that a lot in my life. <laughs> because I'm a big horror movie fan, you sluts. <laughs> Jesus. You know what, Dorotha? Huh? I, I really like your character, Gutter, because she's the smart one. Yes, she's the smart one. We she's actually, so smart, then why is she so dead? Because <laughs> <laughs> she went up against the hammer! Because he uh, snake attacked me from behind. But yeah, Travis and I would like. We would amuse ourselves with like stupid backstories about that we were in like a domestic abusive relationship, or that like we were actually trying to start an anarchist film festival. We got distracted with all the drugs. Well, there is a backstory. Well, that's like the backstories that we would like. Remember what I said when we? We were in that trailer for a bitch. long time. <laughs> oh yeah. I had the bitch. Graham, <laughs> skip up. Um. I love it. Uh, like watching it just now, I was like cheering in my seat when Sierra stabs the shit out of Josh. Yeah, that's that's my, favorite. my favorite. Fuck yeah! Moment. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Chad, yeah, I don't know. I mean, from from uh, you know the production time period, actually watching it, both both uh, you know iterations of experiencing it, 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 the whole thing's one giant fuck yeah. 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 Oh Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. America. Team America. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, that was yours, jumping on Josh's back. That, and um, also finishing that sequence where I'm running from all the hybrids inside of the uh, Oh, good dude, I'm gonna jump on that. That sequence is fucking great. That j it's like, what, I don't know, 23 seconds, 17, it's short, but it's fucking awesome. <laughs> That is a great fucking sequence. That's mine. That's my fuck yeah. <laughs> that's because that's real fear from me on screen. I was terrified of like tripping somehow and the whole stampede of extras wouldn't be able to like stop in time or something. I would get crushed. So. <laughs> I was really running. It was genuine, genuine concern on my face there. They were the real heroes of the shoot. Of Absolutely. They survived on like. Domino's pizza. No, it was Little Caesars pizza for like three weeks and they never complained and they took all the hits and like none of them were stunt people, but they all did like a really badass job. True that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think we're gonna wrap it up unless there's there are more stories you guys like to share. Can I maybe can do one more question? One more question, he no. says. One, two, three, no, no, wait, all right. Oh, oh, No. Uh, you guys mentioned backstories. Uh, shooting in the dark here, but the, the truck had the faded decal of something in Suns. Was there some kind of backstory there for the, for the character, or was that just kind of half a chance for the truck? So he was supposed to be a plow truck driver, and um, he was supposed to be a plow in front of that truck, and that was the truck that smashed into Travis and caused an explosion, but about half of your shooting, 
Um, I uh, asked the producer, said, hey, do you think we can use that big, giant convoy instead? And uh, the owner of the convoy gave us the okay, so we quickly rewrote the script uh, while we were shooting and uh, blew up the convoy. But no, he didn't have any sons. Or he did, and I don't talk to him anymore. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great question. Final question. Uh, the what's next for for Fred? He's a drug dealer. He's a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask him, be a slime too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming and staying, and let's give another round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. We're going to stay together. Sorry, I forgot to tell everybody to hold on. We're going to take a quick photo. Yeah. Right again.